Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. My name is Renata First, and I teach scripture and, th and spirituality at the Oblate School of Theology. Jesus sits, he listens, and he walks with many people in the gospel texts. He sits with Mary, his friend, in her home. He reflects theologically with Mar Martha on the road to her brother's tomb. He listens to the concerns of the Samaritan woman at the well. He reluctantly attends to the Syrophoenician or Canaanite woman who calls out asking him to heal his daughter. And he notices his mother standing at, with other women at the foot of the cross. He had an eye for women. There are only a few examples, these are only a few examples of his personal interactions with women portrayed in the Gospels. Jesús se sienta, habla y camina con mujeres en los textos de los Evangelios. Se sienta con María, su amiga, reflexiona teológicamente con Marta al camino a la tumba de su hermano Lázaro. Y escucha a la mujer samaritana. También escucha a la mujer cananea que estaba molestándolo, ¿eh? que quería que sanara a su hija. También se fija en su madre que está parada en la cruz, al pie de la cruz. Son unas, estos son unos ejemplos en donde Jesús se relaciona con mujeres en los evangelios. How did other women fare in biblical texts? How are they portrayed and, treat, and treated in Old Testament texts, for example? Entonces, ¿cómo se relacionaron la, con las mujeres en otros textos um, de la Biblia? ¿Cómo se trata la mujer en los textos del Antiguo Testamento? In, women are portrayed in a variety of ways in the Old Testament. Some are heroines, such as Rahab, Ruth, Judith. Others are obstacles turned into bearers of God's promises to his people, for example, Sarah and Hannah. But without a doubt, laws based on the concepts of what is pure and impure limit women's activities in the biblical world. Violence directed specifically at women also appears in biblical texts. So there is a woman dismembered by an enraged husband in the book of Judges. There are cities portrayed as wives and daughters who are pillaged and raped in prophetic texts, to name a few. Entonces, ¿cómo vemos a las mujeres en, los anti en el Antiguo Testamento? Hay, um, Positivas, heroínas como Ruth y Judith, pero hay otras que son obstáculos a la gracia de Dios en el mundo que luego se convierten en transmitidoras de esta, de esta gracia, transmisora. Por ejemplo, Sara y Hannah. Pero sin duda, las leyes basadas en los conceptos de lo que es puro e impuro limitan las actividades de las mujeres en el mundo bíblico. También vemos violencia que es específica hacia las mujeres. Por ejemplo, hay una mujer que, es, eh, que la mata a su esposo en la, el libro de los jueces. Y hay um, ciudades representadas como um, esposas y hijas que son... Um, tratadas con violencia en los textos proféticos. So the portrayal of women and their roles in society and worship in the text are major issues. But tradi traditions created by the interpretation of sacred text are equally important. Entonces, ¿cómo se representa la mujer en los textos es importante? Pero también es importante la manera en que interpretamos estos textos, sobre todo en nuestras tradiciones. Así, por ejemplo, for example, what implications do the New Testament texts 
have for women's ministry in the church. Así como se representa la mujer en el Nuevo Testamento, ¿qué implicaciones tiene para su ministerio hoy? Otro ejemplo, another example. The portrayal, the portrayal of the creation of women from the side of Adam in Genesis 2 has been interpreted as a sign of her inferiority throughout history. Entonces, por ejemplo, la manera en que la mujer es representada como hecha del lado de, de Adán en Génesis 2 ha sido interpretado como una seña de su inferioridad a través de la historia. Pero nuestra iglesia ha comenzado a repensar esta interpretación. So our church has begun to rethink this interpretation and I'm going to give you one little example. This is from um, a text called On the Dignity and Vocation of Women, Sobre la Dignidad y la Vocación de las Mujeres. At the time it was published, it was panned as being way behind times. Okay? Cuando fue publicado, dijeron, ay, no, está muy atrasado. Um, because at the time, feminist theologians had advanced quite a bit, and it felt like this text was behind the times. Okay? So this is what it says. The biblical text provides sufficient basis for recognizing the essential equality of women and men from the point of view, sorry, I think I'm breathing into this, from the point of view of their humanity. From the very beginning, both are persons, unlike the other living beings in the world about them. The woman is another I in a common humanity. Entonces, esto dice el texto de Juan Pablo II. El texto bíblico nos da suficientes bases para reconocer que hay una igualdad esencial de la mujer y del hombre desde el punto de vista de su humanidad. Desde el principio, los dos son personas no como los otros seres que viven en el mundo que los entorna. La mujer es otra yo en la, la, la comunidad de la humanidad. Significantly, the scholarship that underlies this apostolic letter, which you will not find footnoted, comes from the work of a female Italian biblical scholar called Bruna Costa Curta, who taught at the Biblicum in Rome. Entonces, es la, es la teóloga bíblica Bruna Costa Curta, una mujer que enseñó en el Biblicum en, Ro, en Roma, que dio eh, los... Um, los puntos bíblicos para esta carta de Juan Pablo II. And for the past 50 years or so, feminist scholars have read the Bible through the lens of a hermeneutics of suspicion in order to ask questions such as, where are the women in this picture? What role and voice do women have in the biblical text? How has this subsequently influenced the role and voice of women in Christian communities? Entonces tenemos como 50 años que las mujeres feministas han leído el texto a través de una hermenéutica de, de, la, sospecha. de la sospecha. Ok. Sospechaba que era el, el término. Para poder uh, responder a las, a las preguntas, ¿dónde está la mujer? en este texto, donde está el papel y la voz de la mujer en el texto bíblico. ¿Cómo ha influenciado el texto bíblico a las comunidades cristianas? Uh, una feminista 
que no es católica, se llama Sharon Ringy, ella habla así, de esta manera de interpretar el texto. Sharon Ringy, who is not Catholic, but is a feminist scholar, speaks of the hermeneutics of suspicion in this way. The different ways women have experienced the power of the Bible individually and as members of different religions, social and ethnic communities have led to a variety of approaches to the task of interpretation. Those approaches range along the continuum from affirmation of the entire Bible as the word of God, which positively informs faith and practice, and the other extreme, which is outright rejection of the Bible as hopelessly and irredeemably, irredeemably misogynistic. Entonces, hay um, las mujeres feministas que dicen la Biblia es la palabra de Dios y hay las otras del otro extremo es están contra la mujer la Biblia que ya no podemos considerarla como palabra de Dios. More recently, female, female scholars working to understand the cultural background of biblical texts have warned against the issue of presentism, okay? The practice of interpreting biblical data through the categories of our present worldview. Entonces, hay uh, feministas trabajando sobre el, el trasfondo cultural de los textos bíblicos que hablan de un término que se llama presentism, presentismo, en el, no en el sentido español de presentir algo, sino tener solamente una visión a través del presente. Okay? Biblical scholarship in general in the Catholic Church has slowly becoming uh, familiar with feminist approaches. And the last time it was mentioned in a um, official document is in the 1994 document on the interpretation of scripture in the church, in which feminism was acknowledged as a viable way of um, looking at the text. But there were several um, cautions with it, okay? Entonces, en el documento de 1994 de la, de la Comisión Pontífica de la Biblia, se mencionó el, el proceso feminista para leer la Biblia con precaución. Biblical scholarship in general, so I'm, I've presented a little bit about um, women, but we know that gender issues are much broader, okay? So biblical scholarship in general, but especially in the Catholic Church, is barely scratching the surface in relation to LGBTQ issues, okay? So I would like to give you examples of how scholars are creatively rereading, in this case, the Old Testament. This is a reinterpretation of the story of Ehud and Jael in Judges uh, chapters three to five. And this is a Jewish scholar. Her name is Sarah Emanuel. So she's giving us uh, a glimpse into what is it like to interpret scripture um, from a, a non-heterosexual point of view. Okay, this is what she says. From a stance of heterosuspicion, so they're incorporating the idea of um, uh, hermeneutics of suspicion, okay? And with a theoretical view to intertextuality and queer survivance. Now, what is that? Queer survivance is a technical term, and it means from the point of view of trauma and survival that the LGBTQ community has experienced, this is how I'm going to read this text. 
So she says, I will argue that Ehud and Jael subvert oppressive power structures through gender bending performances. Now she talks about Ehud in Judges 3, um, who is ruling, one of the judges uh, ruling Israel, and Israel is under the thumb of one of its enemies. And so Ehud, who is left handed, comes from the tribe of Benjamin, whose, whose name means the right-handed peoples, okay? So he's a lefty in a right-handed society, goes and he um, puts a, a sword on his right hand. He hides it under his clothes. And he goes and he uh, gives the tribute to this king, Eglon, whose name means more or less fat cow, okay? And he's sitting on his throne, and um, all the people leave, okay? And so Ehud does the unexpected. He takes his left hand, because they've um, looked him over to see if he has a weapon. He takes his left hand, and he picks his weapon from the right, and he kills Eglon, who is indeed sitting on a throne. He is sitting, relieving himself. Okay, so the argument that um, Sarah Emanuel is making is that the text is bending the expectations of the reader through all of these strange little details that are in it. On the other hand, you may have heard the story of Jael, or Jael, um, who is um, a woman who is the wife of someone, okay? And Rebecca, who is the judge in Israel, has just had this mighty um, victory over Sisera, okay? And Sisera comes running over to Jael's tent. This is a very compressed version of it. He comes over and she says, come in and lie down and rest. And while he's resting, she drives a tent peg through his temple. Sarah Emanuel says that this embodies the ambivalent and even almost comic use of identity markers, something that's very important to LGBTQ community. Taking such in similarities into consider, I suggest that Ehud and Jael's queer comic consciousness becomes another theme within the book of Judges as a whole. And what she ends up doing is she upsets the normal interpretation of what scholars have said for years and years, oh yeah, there's a, a process going on in Judges where there is, they don't listen to God, they, they're punished. God sends them a judge, gets them out of that. But the spiraling is that it's going from bad to worse the whole time. She argues that instead of focusing on the repetition of the Israelites' self-fulfilling demise, this trope spotlights the creative ways in which the judge's narrative becomes one of, our, one of survival and reflects on ancient culture's will to resist. This reflects this will to resist, to persist, and indeed to live is the LGBTQ response to trauma and survival. Okay, and that's how she's incorporating this reading of the text. So this leaves us with an ever-evolving and challenging question. How can women, how can LGBTQ persons and their faith communities continue to interpret the biblical text in a way that is healthy for themselves, for their faith, and for their families? 
If you would like more information about um, this way of viewing the text, you may want to look at something, just Google it, from the Society of Biblical Literature called Horizons of LGBTQ Hermeneutics. Okay. This is not an approach that the Catholic Church has embraced wholeheartedly. I think primarily because it's new. Okay. It's something that's happened in the last five to ten years. So there, we're on the, on the cusp of something new that's coming into the church. And so I would like to leave you with a question, or if you have your own questions, if you would take the sheet that's on your table, it has mock at the top of it. You'll see that on the left-hand side, it's respect. So, tomen la hoja y van a ver de la hoja de mac van a ver eh, la palabra respeto. Por favor, tomenlo. Take this sheet. Okay. Take this sheet. Read it through. And think about which of these um, letters do I find most difficult when I am listening to sexism and gender issues. Okay. And once you have done that, so there's two parts to this, once you have that, maybe you'd like to talk about um, how would you receive a feminist or an LGBTQ reading of your favorite biblical text? Okay? Thank you. Yeah.